Okay, in this video we're going to start exploring a little bit more uh, some of the factors that actually uh, are linked to and contribute to water supplies on a global perspective. Um, and we're going to take three of them. They are climate, river systems and geology. So those are the three that we're going to look at. Okay, we'll start off with climate. If you have a look at the map that you've got in front of you now, you can start to see this is obviously January. The blue represents the level of precipitation. So we're talking about the amount of rainfall that we get. Uh, so the bluer the colour, the greater the amount of rainfall. So you're look, talking about the uh, Amazonian Basin, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, etc. through this region here. Uh, in January, that's the region that's receiving, globally speaking, the most rainfall. Uh, obviously, you can still spot some of the very dry areas here. Take note, in particular, of this region of India. We, that's going to be quite important later on. So take note of uh, the changes that occur in this particular region. Okay. As we move towards April, uh, you can see that this band of rainfall, it's more noticeable in Africa than anywhere else, but this band of particularly heavy rainfall is starting to move further north. Uh, so we've got, we've got a movement of that rainfall, um, and also you can start to see it creeping into this part of Asia. Uh, so Japan, China, um, these, these areas around Thailand and Bangladesh is starting to receive uh, a considerably um, greater level of rainfall, or precipitation I should say. As we start to move into August, so this is for the Northern Hemisphere, the summer months, you can definitively see that we are now in what you would refer to as a monsoon season in uh, India, or at least in, in Southern Asia, the Indian subcontinent here, you, we've started to receive a, a lot more rainfall. Um, you can also notice that this band of rain has actually moved further north, and you've got a drier area here. So seasonally speaking, um, this area of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, receives rainfall during uh, one portion of the year but not during another. So we have this seasonal effect of rainfall. You'll actually notice that the Northern Hemisphere, it, it changes relatively little uh, so in, in, in the latitudes where we are. It doesn't really change very much. Uh, but the regions around the equator um, are actually changing quite considerably. Certainly between the tropics are changing quite considerably uh, as it moves through. August as a month is pretty much the extent at which uh, this moves. There is, a, there is a name for this actually, it's called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, uh, sometimes shortened to the ITCZ, uh, and this actually is a band that moves north and south over the course of the year, um, taking with it the rainfall. You can understand why, given the idea of the, the tilt of the Earth and the movement of the Earth around the Sun, uh, and which areas are receiving the most solar radiation as well. So it, it kind of follows that pattern on an annual basis. Um, as we move so later in the year, it is receding south once more and the monsoon rains start to leave before you get back to uh, January and the cycle starts over again. So this idea of climate, uh, it, it moves this band of precipitation. So if we're talking about water supply, this will have a direct impact on water supply because if you take, for example, the Indian subcontinent, during the course of their summer months when they're receiving the most rainfall, there is more water available. But during the course of the winter months when there's less, there might be less water available. And it's not just about how much rainfall you get. It's usable water. We're going to get a situation... Uh, for example, where the river systems just discharge most of the water out. Uh, so it, it becomes unusable. So storage then becomes uh, a little bit more of an issue. And remember, depending on the region you live, you may have one distinct period of rainfall, so the monsoon season in uh, the Indian subcontinent, or you may get two distinct periods of rainfall. Uh, if you are in this band just north of the equator, where the band of rainfall moves north and south, and so this is where the most movement will get, you will get one band of rainfall when it passes over you the first time, and you'll get another band of rainfall when it passes over you the second time. So you get two periods of rainfall, uh, or increased rainfall over the course of the year, whereas the Indian subcontinent might only get one, this region of sub-Saharan Africa may also only get 
one significant period of heavier rainfall. This is also going to affect the biomes. Now this is quite a complicated map of, of biomes. Uh, so if you wanted to pause it and, and have a little bit of a closer look at the map of um, the varying biomes, then, then feel free to do so. Uh, but if you imagine that the amount of rainfall will have a direct impact on the type of vegetation that can be grown in the region and therefore the type of biome that you will actually receive, it should go pretty much without saying that your... Uh, regions that have got significant levels of rainfall throughout the course of the year uh, are going to be much more tropical, so tropical rainforest. Uh, you might get subtropical dry forest around the outside of it where there's a little bit less rain, but generally speaking you're going to have increased levels of um, moisture, increased levels of precipitation, so consequently uh, increased trophic levels which you'll look at in biodiversity. It's also important to remember that some regions have got uh, mountains and higher land that surround them or uh, actually run through them themselves. Um, this will create a slightly different level of um, precipitation and level of water usage. So obviously if you've got an area that has got heavy snowfall on the mountains and snowpack on the mountains then you're going to get periods of the year when this is released um, if you think about, for example, Yosemite National Park, um, the rivers themselves will start to swell in the spring and early part of the summer because you've got melting of the snowpack. So you've got more and more water that will come out at that point. Even though perhaps there might not be as much precipitation, you still get water flowing through the rivers because of the snowpack actually releasing that water. Uh, similar sort of things would happen in, in the Himalayas, uh, surrounding the Alps, uh, etc. So you've got quite a range of um, ideas. And this just returns to the idea uh, of the monsoon. This is actually a picture of Mumbai. Um, during the monsoon season, as you can see, there is an awful lot of water that falls during the monsoon season. Uh, it's not always usable. Uh, this is filling up the streets, it's, this is not usable water, people can't necessarily use this water for, uh, they do, but they, maybe they shouldn't use the water because it's not always healthy to use some of this water. Um, but it does pose a problem for countries that have a monsoon season, is how do you store and how do you make best use of that water? And from an ecological perspective, should you be storing that water because you, you're impacting the balance of an ecological system? Um, so is, there, is that necessary for you to do that? The second uh, factor that's linked to water supply is obviously the river systems themselves. Uh, this image here is of the uh, Amazon watershed, so the Amazon River Basin. Uh, and as you can imagine, you've got a huge area um, that is drained via the Amazon River. And so obviously you're going to have... Um, the level of water increasing as you get further downstream because you've got more and more and more and more uh, tributaries uh, that are feeding the Amazon itself. Uh, so the discharge, uh, the mouth of the river, is going to be huge. So the, the volume of water that's taken out of the river uh, is immense when we're talking about the Amazon. You can see the figure here. Um, but rivers also have this ability to transfer uh, more water across a continent. So this is quite an important thing, especially when we take into, the, uh, into account the idea of continentality, which you looked at at GCSE, um, where rivers are actually become quite important in moving water from one area to another, uh, perhaps even through an area that doesn't actually receive very much precipitation, but there's still water moving through the area because of the idea of rivers. Uh, and this can change different river regimes. I think the, the highest discharging river on Earth is actually the Congo um, in sub-Saharan Africa, coming out of the DRC. Uh, so that's the highest um, discharging river on Earth. So much so, in fact, that ships that used to pass by the, con the mouth of the Congo uh, would almost have to tack in to, to account for the level of discharge that would push them further out into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so the river regime overall... That's the dis discharge over an extended period of time. So different rivers would have different river regimes. Finally, we come to look at geology and the impact that geology can have on uh, 
water supply for humanity. Uh, if you take into account uh, different types of geology, then it is going to have an effect on the drainage basin itself uh, and the water supply in that area. So if you have something like impermeable rocks, um, granite for example, you're going to have quite a lot of water that sits on the surface. Uh, and as the water sits on the surface, uh, it, it will create surface flow because the granite is impermeable. It doesn't let water percolate through into uh, potential groundwater storage. So you get increased surface runoff. Uh, and that then changes the drainage density. So how well or how poorly the um, river channels are able to drain the watershed. So it, it changes um, the construct of the river. Uh, it is important to be able to have aquifers. As we mentioned before about the, this idea of storage, uh, as you can see from this, um, the graph here, it is a monsoon climate in this region, uh, in, in, in the Indian subcontinent, so you do have much more uh, rainfall in the summer months. So you have to be able to store that water. If you look at the discharge of the rivers, so these monsoon river regimes, Look at the level of discharge and how it changes in the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. You, you get this spike, and it's a very, very sudden spike that you get. And then it's relatively low throughout the course of the remainder of the year. So this, the water in this region is being lost. If you imagine that all that water above this line is lost to the sea. It's, it goes back out into the hydrological cycle, and once it's in the sea, it's not really... Um, easily usable so it has a, an important impact on that so the idea of aquifers that can store water uh, and become productive in, in this case in the north of the country uh, is very very important because you can use that water over a longer period of time and the, uh, the hope is that the monsoon rains recharge those aquifers and, and allow that level of storage but again it depends on the permeability of the rocks in the system if the Oglala um, aquifer in North America for example this is one of the largest aquifers in the world um, and you can see the extent of it here if you know your uh, US geography which you should do anyway of course um, you can see the extent to which this uh, aquifer is, is huge and it, it has uh, in essence um, allowed the development of very productive um, agriculture in, the, in these regions exceptionally productive agriculture uh, down sort of in the corn belt down there um, and that's basically because of the geology that we have uh, within the regions if you have something like Cambrian sandstone this image here of Cambrian sandstone it will allow water to uh, pass through and it can go into sandstone underground and sandstone and um, in many ways chalk as well so those porous sandstones will allow for the storage of vast vast quantities of water so the Oglala um, aquifer does allow for the storage of massive, massive amounts of water. Uh, if, unfortunately, you have something more impermeable, uh, like granite, and it doesn't allow it to pass through, then it changes the drainage density, and the water is, is running off the surface, and it's lost in many ways. Uh, okay, so we've looked at climate, river systems, and geology, and how they affect water supply. I uh, hope that helps.